Okay, I'd like to welcome you all to the uh, special uh, evening event. Uh, this is the only event tonight uh, at this conference and the only event worth mentioning in the United States tonight. <laughs> okay, so we have a panel here of um, four science fiction greats. Uh, unfortunately, Jerry Pernelli could not make it because he is ill. But uh, we have on here uh, four truly notable uh, science fiction authors. Um, we have uh, Larry Niven, who has uh, written any number of, of great science fiction novels, Ringworld, Footfall, Lucifer's Hammer, but, well, Ringworld, what else can one say beyond that? Uh, and, okay, uh, yeah. Greg Benford, the author of Timescape and, and many other uh, cosmos. Cosmism. Cosm. Cosm. Okay. Okay. So, and that, and uh, okay, Jeff Landis, who's a working scientist at NASA Glenn Research Center, but he wrote Mars Crossing, and also numerous short works, including I think one that won the Hugo Award, uh, and uh, David Brin, uh, the author of uh, Star Tide Rising, The Uplift War, The Postman, which was screwed up as a movie, but. <laughs> I'm sure the pay was good, um, <laughs> but 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 no, it was a pretty good movie. And um, but actually, uh, author of many great books: The Practice Effect, uh, Existence, Earth, and so forth. So anyway, these guys. Uh, I mean. As I think I mentioned this morning, uh, this is like having a panel a generation ago featuring Heinlein, Asimov, and Arthur Clarke. So it's extraordinary. And uh, we, um, so I'm just going to moderate the panel. I try to avoid speaking, except I probably won't. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but um, it, it's about the human future in space because. Uh, to a very real extent, I, I think the space age is a creation of science fiction writers. Um, and uh, who, uh, you know, once we started learning that, you know, there were these other planets out there and they were Earth-like to one degree or another and so there could be civilizations there and what are the possibilities and what is the possibility, you know, that science opens up in terms of what people can do um, beyond, you, you know, inter planetary stuff, but just in general. And uh, you know, what, what are the true possibilities for existence? And um, so, uh, and you know, if, if you look at uh, popular culture today, it's defined, our vision of the future is defined by science fiction, and, and, and in particular by two alternative uh, views of that future, one of which is an expansive view, if you will, the Star Trek future of humans venturing out into space, and things aren't perfect, and it's certainly not without risk, but it's filled with adventure and possibilities and opportunities. And then there's the alternative future in which we do not go into space, and we remain confined to one planet with shrinking possibilities, and you might call that the soil and green version of the future. <laughs> um, and, um, and there they are, and, and they're very uh, significant because they, I mean, one, argues that we should promote human freedom. The other says that it, it is doomed, it should be restricted. Uh, one argues that ultimately you, all humans are friends because the more creativity we all exercise, the more possibilities there will be for all of us, whereas the other basically says we're all competitors for a shrinking piece of a shrinking pie. Anyway, uh, with that, I, I'm going to throw some questions at, at the members of the panel. Uh, I'm just going to start, you know, First of all, what's your vision of the human future in space in the next hundred years, in the next thousand years, in the next ten thousand years? You know, uh, you know, where are we going? What's what's it, what? What do you think is really going to happen ultimately? I mean, putting aside, you know, whether this administration, that administration does this, or does that, or whether this program gets it, but you know, how's this thing going to hash out? Why? Why don't? How about Greg Benford or, or whoever wants to start? Thanks, thanks, Bob. Uh, let me say one thing. Uh, I said to Bob, you could frame it on a scale of a century if you ask two questions, which are part 
of your general I'll, question. I'll ask those questions, but I want to. Oh, you're going to ask. Okay, fine. Yeah. Uh, I'm an optimist. I think outward uh, is always the right direction. And uh, we're speaking in the country that is known for this position, and there's a reason for that. Larry. Uh, space mm -hmm. was going to be easy. Space was easy because science fiction writers uh, wanted it that way for the, for, for the purpose of storytelling. Yeah. Uh, Mars, the Mars was inhabited. Get the mic closer. Mars was always inhabited, even when I wrote it. Um, <laughs> Which, it, which was 53 years ago. Uh, we're gonna have space travel. We're, we're gonna. What? Well, ah. Testing, testing. All right, there you are. Sometime in the past 300,000 years, someone had painted a smiley face across the Earth's moon. I wrote that as a. Uh, as an opener, when uh, when uh, a class was writing openers for stories, uh, narrative hooks, and I never used it. Uh, so you can have it. <laughs> I don't know what the what the future of space travel is going to look like. I'm not I'm not uh, easy with politics, uh, but it's still true that the asteroid belt contains the wealth of, of the universe. And, uh, and we, we haven't invented, it, it's raining soup and we haven't invented soup bowls yet, <laughs> Jerry Pornell's claim. Uh, we're going to, to go out there, we're going to get rich doing it, uh, we're going to take over the solar system and eventually develop a, a type one civilization. Yeah. Which masters the solar system, right? The Kardashian. Type, type one no, masters right. the earth. Oh, that's right. We <laughs> haven't mastered the earth yet, but we need to, to, to take over the solar system to some extent to master the earth. Uh, terraforming will be performed first upon the earth, but we'd be, a, be better off uh, working with Mars just to learn the basic rules. Yeah. Jeff? Good. We're going to Mars. Uh, if not this generation, and I certainly hope it's this generation, we are going. If not this generation, the next. If not that, the next. That's going to happen. It's going to happen because Mars is out there. It's a real place. And we as humans expand outward. That's what we do. That's part of what is us. But Mars is not our destination. Mars is just a stop on the way. One of the many planets that we're going out to as we colonize the whole solar system from Mercury out into the Oort cloud as perhaps a pause on our way even further out. I think that we're going to colonize the solar system. We're going to make it out. There's a lot of planets out there. There's a lot of moons. There's a lot of places that we can go to. And you know what? They're all exciting. I want to go everywhere. I want to go to all the places. I want to visit Triton. I want to visit Saturn. I want to float in the atmosphere of Saturn. There is a lot out there. We need to go. And now you know why he's been nominated for more Hugos than uh, almost anybody. Yeah, that's I'm, true. I've, I've, how do you follow an act like that? Uh, well, you start by trying to take a big picture perspective and be contrary. My blog is called Contrary Brin, so as much as I agree with absolutely everything Jeff says, I'm also going to say that I don't think that's true. I don't think there's any, any, any causal relationship. If you look across the last 6,000 years, 99.99% of our cultures were horrible pyramid-shaped oligarchies in which uh, feudal families with, uh, inherited power and made sure that above all there was one priority and that's making sure their sons would inherit other people's sons and daughters. And under those circumstances, uh, if you ever read Ray Bradbury's uh, short story, The Flying Machine, the emperor kills the guy who, ki who makes the flying machine because it destabilizes. But is that necessary? Is that necessary to happen um, pretty much exactly 100 years ago, no, actually 120 years ago, 
Frederick Jackson Turner wrote a book that scared everybody in America called The Closing of the American Frontier. And it talked about how right before everyone's eyes, uh, within just 30 or 40 years, all, all the really prime real estate that had been stolen fair and square from the natives um, it, uh, was being snapped up. And that an actual frontier beyond which you could just remake yourself, change your name, remake yourself, which had been in the uh, at least white American and then thankfully, because we expand our definitions, American psyche was gone or would be gone shortly. And he said, well, this is probably going to have a simple effect, and that is this expansive, individualist, irascibly confident, optimistic that you can remake yourself psyche that made us so different will shut down and will become another hierarchical, silly people like Europeans. Uh, but he said something very smart. He said, and this was 1893, he said, there's a possibility that these habits of thinking have become so ingrained in our mythologies and the way we think that we'll simply invent new frontiers. Within 10 years, Americans were flying through the sky. <laughs> And that is, you see, it's, it's not a foregone conclusion that just because it's there, we're going to have to fight for the kind of civilization that fools brilliant young men into <laughs> saying things like, of course we'll go because it's there. You're a product of this marvel. We all are. And proud of it. <laughs> yes, <laughs> right. Okay. So is this conference and so is he. <laughs> Well, okay, I'm going to ask a, a short question to each member of the panel, but then I'm going to follow it up. Uh, I'll ask for an explanation. Okay, first of all, do you believe there's life in space? Just quickly, yes, no. Uh, there's life in space, but they're, they're being quite silent about it. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's hard for me to believe that we're the only life form that, that's, uh, that's evolved in this vastness. But we might be uh, we might be rare. We are almost certainly rare, and we may be the, among the oldest uh, intelligent races. Uh, yeah. We don't see any sign of uh, Dyson spheres and the like. Yes, I agree. Yeah, we, we first we haven't looked hard enough. We've just been new at this, particularly at SETI. But still, you know, when, every day when I read the front page of the newspaper. It, it's impossible to believe we could possibly be the smartest species in the galaxy. <laughs> <laughs> Alas, we probably are. We don't know enough to answer that question. The origin of life is still scientifically an unknown. It's a mystery. So any answer that I give is going to be a matter of faith. It's a guess. Yeah, but I want to know your faith. Guess. I want to know I your faith. Guess. In your I guess. faith. I will guess that it's unlikely that we could be unique in the universe, yeah. but I have to state that that is purely a shot in the dark. That's what I am guessing, but I am absolutely unable to put numbers to try and prove that statement. Well, it's called the Fermi Paradox, and I've been cataloging answers since a paper in 1983. Uh, I have my own opinions about what are the most likely explanations. I think that feudalism is number five on my list. Uh, I think it's a trap that has co uh, lobotomized probably a lot of aliens out there. Um, if you look at the number of places, planets we've discovered, well, that's one factor in the Drake equation gone. We know planets are everywhere, especially if you include the fact that even a solar system that doesn't have an Earth-like Goldilocks zone ocean world likely has life because we think there may be as many as 12 ice-roofed ocean worlds in this solar system. Not just Europa, not just Enceladus, not just extremely weird, I want to go there, Titan, but as many as 12. Well, if that's the case, 
then there are abodes of liquid water in orbit around every single star, and that does not include the comets that Greg and I wrote about in Heart of the Comet, which early in a solar system probably had liquid interiors, and you're talking trillions of floating test tubes. No, I, I think life is prob probably pretty common. All right, so, all right, so what's the optimal path to discover life in uh, our solar system? Uh, what was the question? What's the you? optimal, what, how would you go about, in other words, look, uh, about most of you, uh, I think all of you said you s suspect that there's life. Um, and I, I would certainly agree with that. Uh, as above, so below, as below, so above. Uh, but as Jeff said, it hasn't been proven. So how do we prove it? Uh, how do we find it? How do we uh, either prove or disprove this hypothesis? In the 1900s, I believe uh, a, a group tried to send signals to Mars, uh, lighting up a wide area of the Earth that they'd be able to spot with their telescopes. Uh, we've tried talking to Martians, uh, and it hasn't worked. Now I guess we dig, we see if there are microbes somewhere. Water seems easy. Uh, on all of, on all of uh, planets and moons. Yeah, well, the obvious thing, although it's contrary to current passing NASA doctrine, uh, <clears throat> which wants to fly by Enceladus and pick up some stuff from from geysers, not a bad idea. But we have a continuing mystery on Mars: the emission of methane. Periodic, uh, not periodic, occasional, detected by rovers on the ground and, and from satellite, which doesn't fit our model of the atmosphere. It goes away very quickly, suggesting the model of the atmosphere and the surface is wrong. But it's a clear detection uh, in the range of uh, 10 or 20 parts per million. Uh, there with is no known Earth on Mars. Yeah. So the easiest explanation is that most of the methane, a lot, aside from that, from volcanoes on the Earth occurs from microbial life beneath the surface of the Earth. By the way, there's more life below the surface of the Earth than there is above it in total mass. There are an enormous volume of microbes who've been hiding from this oxygen and atmosphere for several billion years. And they're still there. Might well have happened on Mars, which is a little shorter time scale. And so the obvious thing to do is to go into the caves of Mars, the easiest way to get, get beneath the surface, of which we know some hundreds, with a rover, and look at the walls and go deeper and deeper. That's an obvious paradigm. I served on a panel put together by Bruce Murray in 1995-96 at JPL called Mars Outpost about saying, question of why life is going to require close inspection. How do we build an outpost? And we made up a whole list. And paradigm of what you put on the surface. You put down resources, computational, energy, life support, all that before you send humans, a la the case for going to Mars, uh, Mars Direct. And then you explore things like caves. This was 1995. And we issued a report and so forth, and so it was put in a drawer. <laughs> but it remains. It's the obvious thing to do for life in the solar system. The clearest case, mysterious evidence, highly suggestive of our experience. Uh, you can deal with the ice worlds later and the submerged oceans. But here's a case that the closest thing we knew for life on Earth. Uh, they once had seas on Mars. We know that. Big seas. Shallow, not as deep as ours, because plate, uh, plate tectonics vanished within about half a billion years on Mars. We know that, too, from the magnetic signatures still remaining in the, in the crust. So let's go there and do that. But I would add that the rovers are going to be a good thing to do over a scale of 10 to maybe 20 more years. But in the long run, you're going to need field biologists. And that's the agenda for also leading to colonization. So it all fits together seamlessly. You ask the major scientific question, you get the major social question. Should we establish a role for humanity elsewhere in the solar system? in case the worst case happens on Earth. The way to find out whether there's life elsewhere in the solar system is to go there. 
and look. Uh, and I think we, actually, we all agree on this. I don't think this will be controversial, except, of course, for contrarian Bryn. Uh, and, and we love him because he is contrarian. And I say that actually with perfect sincerity. I do love him because he's contrarian. We need somebody to be contrarian. Yes. Uh, there's two types of life we need to look for. There is life as we know it and life as we don't know it. Life as we know it is based on aqueous chemistry. So we know where to look. We need to look in places that have liquid water at least some of the time. And the watchword among the astrobiologists on Earth is that every place on Earth that has liquid water for at least part of the year, you can find some form of life. Probably microbial, but if you look hard enough, you can find it. And we know how to look for life as we know it. The formulation of life as we know it is proteins that are built by DNA and RNA. And in fact, there's an interesting signature of life on Earth, and that signature is called chirality, that all of the molecules are either left-handed, all of them left-handed, or right-handed. So if we look at the molecules and see, are they all left-handed molecules, there are no known mechanisms to produce only one chirality except for the self-replicating machines that we call life. So that is a interesting way to look for life, is to look for these carbon compounds and see if they have chirality. But life as we don't know it is the hard one to look for. How do we know how to find life if we don't know what it is? And the only answer to that is we have to look everywhere. We can't just look at the places where we think life is. We're going to have to look at places where we don't think life is. Uh, we're going to have to just examine all of the possibilities. There's a lot of places that astrobiologists are only vaguely beginning to think about. Astrobiologists are now thinking about looking for life in the clouds of Venus, for example. There's a thought, well... Is anybody taking yeah. bets? <laughs> <laughs> I, know some, I know some people, Venus scientists, who are very enthusiastic at saying that the dark ultraviolet absorbing particles in the clouds of Venus have spectral signatures that match the signatures of acidophilic bacteria, and they're saying that they think we really need to go and look in the clouds of Venus for life. The I'm, Fred, I'm very dubious, Fred Hoyle did but, say uh, that about molecular yeah. clouds, in yes. interstellar molecular Places, clouds. That's exactly it. We need to look not just where we think life is, but to find life as we don't know it, we have to look in places where we don't know if we'll find it. Mm -hmm. So that might be hard. Yeah, the, well, the, the, the fundamental thing you look for is a place where entropy is being anomalously shifted from one er out of a small area. Uh, the net amount of entropy increases. That's what we do as living beings. We increase the rate of, of entropy, but we decrease it in small packet areas. Uh, and just look at the clearness of a baby's eyes. Um, yeah, there are lots and lots of things we need to be doing. We need to be looking um, for life. Uh, we need to be doing the other thing that people are obsessed with regarding Mars, and that is looking for abodes for ourselves. And these two concepts come into conflict with each other. Already we are seeing the arguments that you see portrayed in uh, Kim Stanley Robinson's Mars series between the preservationists and the exploiters. And that is, you know, if we are going to Mars to live, we are going to probably kill whatever's there. We're very good at that. Um, so one thing that I've proposed in a story, and I'm going to mention it more often, is that in advance we hold these discussions, check the wind patterns on Mars, and see if there is some degree of what we have on Earth, and that's a degree of non-communication between the hemispheres um, in, in the atmosphere. And if that's the case, give choose one to go to the colonizers and choose one hemisphere to go to, the pr to be preserved forever. Yeah. Uh, now, that's going to be revisited in 500 years or 100 years or in 50 years, but it's a good start and it's a better gesture. It's a better deal than Columbus offered when he landed. Yeah. Uh, um, 
Now, there are various aspects to all of this. Back when Bruce Murray was holding those meetings in the 80s and 90s, um, I proposed that we need to look at Phobos. Uh, the Russians have kept trying to go to Phobos because they know it's one of the most valuable places in the solar system. It might conceivably be a carbonaceous asteroid, in which case it has volatiles like water. Extremely valuable, um, useful if you're going to go down to the surface, uh, but also it's a great place to stash um, supplies. If you look at how um, you climb Mount Everest or how you go to the South Pole, you create caches along the way. And um, caching is the biggest and most important thing. And it occurred to me that we could, next year, the year after that, start sending freighters, real slow freighters, ideally solar sail freighters, because then you, we don't have to pay for the fuel, and just crank them to Phobos and they could take 10 years, they could take 20 years, and we don't have, even have to know details of the mission because there's plenty of non-mission specific stuff they'll need. Wrenches, TV dinners, water. All of this stuff would be best sent 10 years in advance. And then once it's at Phobos and the little light is flinking on and off, then you, it's easier to persuade Congress and others to pay for the manned mission because we already got the stuff there, you see? So there's a sneaky rhythm to it. So we need three modes of space transportation. We need um, slow boat freighter delivery of just the basic non-mission specific crap that's heavy but can go slow. We need to be able to send the mission-specific equipment on the order of a year or so. And then what we really need is a really fast way to send the astronauts, because when they know when they're getting there, the robots are already reporting that on Phobos, everything's already built and ready. All right. Um, look, one of the uh, interesting facts about life on Earth is the quickness with which it appeared. We have um, fossils of life on Earth dating back 3.5 billion years, which is within a couple of hundred million years after the end of the heavy bombardment, which previously made uh, life on Earth uninhabitable. We have uh, uh, arguable fossils, fossils that, that many people defend and others contest, that from 3.8 billion years ago, virtually simultaneous with the end of the heavy bombardment, and recently I read an article about some claims of uh, evidence of, of life that was 4.2 billion years old, which would put it in the middle of the heavy bombardment and perhaps maybe it appeared but didn't last, uh, that it maybe it happened during a brief pause. But in any case, whichever, even if you believe the most conservative of this is 3.5, it appeared quickly. And uh, so the question is why? Is it because life appears from chemistry spontaneously very quickly? Or was life around? Were there spores of life around, uh, either natural or seeded, uh, pre extraterrestrials sending out protected spores that so as soon as a planet becomes uh, able to support life, it gets it. Just like on Earth, it doesn't take long for any barren place becomes seeded with life because there are seeds flying all over the place all the time. So what is it? Is it that life emerges from chemistry spontaneously through self-organization quickly? Or are we basically, uh, you know, the early experiments with spontaneous generation, some people thought that life spontaneously generated on culture medium until it was shown, well, no, it's because actually there's spores and seeds and bacteria and whatever, germs, if you will, flying around and that if any place is exposed, it gets seeded quickly. Which, which, is, is, which is it? Well, we're science fiction writers, so we believe it happens quickly and everywhere because that's what makes good science fiction. Yeah, well, it clearly happens quick. Okay, but by the way, let me just say something. The members of this panel, in addition to be science fiction writers, all have a science fi uh, scientific background. Okay, Larry Niven was a mathematician before he became a science fiction writer. Uh, Greg Benford and David uh, Brin are uh, astrophysicists, and, and I, I think Brin 
went full time as a writer at a certain point. Uh, Benford continued to be a working scientist uh, to this day. Uh, and Jeff Landis is a, a physicist and, and engineer at NASA. So th these people are not just talking, you know, but like the fools in Shakespeare, as science fiction writers, they're able to tell the truth. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah, Jeff, um, Je and Jeff, even more than that, is like every character you see on Star Trek, except for the aliens, a government employee. <laughs> <laughs> I've been wearing the shirt. And it's not red. Um, he advertises. Uh, Bob, uh, Bob has a paper out about yeah. the um, mm -hmm. panspermia notion, the notion of the spreading of, deliberate spreading of right. um, yeah. information uh, of, of bacteria by aliens. Yeah. You notice uh, it's never pan over? Pan over, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, Just saying. Uh, Panovia. Panovia, <laughs> a new rock band. The, uh, the, the different take he takes on it is that they are sending uh, the these bacteria only have to to live, and the other half of their genome is recorded message information. But uh, my novel, Existence, is basically about that. It's about existence. Oh, it's, well, it's got a, just about the most arrogant title. Uh, Larry, did you have something you wanted to say about this? Yeah, I should say a word in favor of the Chipsithra. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the idea is the, the galaxy has been conquered by alien life, and they own the galaxy. But when they say that, they're talking about only the uh, red dwarf stars. Hmm. They haven't come here because, the, because the, there's no red dwarf star to visit, and no planets uh, ser serving their kind of life. Uh, eventually, they land. Uh, we. Red dwarves apparently occupy about 75% of the galaxy. Uh, if something has developed uh, in terms of life, it would be surprising if, it, if they weren't uh, associ associated with red dwarves. Yeah. We should be looking in, in, the, in that direction. Right. Yeah, it's a whole galaxy full of short people. <laughs> right. uh, I, I always preferred Doctor Who, actually. Doctor Who? Sh Dr. Short Dr. Republic. Doctor what? <laughs> Red? But again, I'd like to pose, uh, I was asking a, a more direct question. We were dodging the question, you noticed yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> Did it appear swiftly because life self-generates swiftly or because life is already there and it's ready to pounce whenever? Uh, as, I, as I was saying earlier, you don't need to, uh, I don't believe you need to spread life through the, even the pans, original panspermia guys, Fred Hoyle, Chandra Wickramasinghe, and the cult that Arrhenius. has formed around them. Yeah. Um, the, even they say that it started somewhere and it, and it mm -hmm. spread from that point. Yeah, it's like a um, franchise, really. If you, <laughs> if you were to calculate the sheer volume of energized, magnetized, active, salty water inside yeah. the several trillion comets that at the beginning of our solar system were, had molten interiors yeah. because of recently cr yeah. created supernova dispersed aluminum 26, you would have more test tubes, you would have more volume of water than 100 Earths, uh, Earth, you know, they think, Darwin said, a calm little pool. Yeah. So I'm not really concerned about that part of the Drake equation. Um, I'm much more concerned about the parts that are about whether or not um, there's a great filter. That's yeah. the phrase that's used by Nicholas Bostrom and some of the other gloomy and doomy guys who say that if there's a lot of life in the universe and intelligence happens, then we're doomed because the thing that's keeping down the number of extraterrestrials out there lies ahead of us, the filter lies ahead of us, rather than behind us. So they think it would be bad news to find life elsewhere. Yeah. Dr. Zubrin, you spoke of uh, the, the quickness with which life evolved. Uh, did, have you noticed the slowness with which it evolved genetics? Uh, life, 
life was life, but it wasn't evolving yeah. for, for, a billion, for a couple of billion years. You mean just eukaryotes, for yeah. example. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, before that, there was the transition. Uh, yeah. The blue-green algae were slowly converting mm -hmm. the atmosphere, but the oxygen was getting sucked up by the exposed iron. Yeah. But at a certain point, um, the algae, the cyanobacteria had it, but the algae developed photosynthesis. And when that happened, they poured out so much oxygen and pulled out so much CO2 that the Earth froze. We had the reverse of climate change, and you got an ice age that covered the whole yeah. planet. Right. Um, and so life creates crises, and we're creating a crisis right now on this planet called the Anthropocene. Yeah. yeah. I got two comments. One is to point out that these two answers, is it easy to make life or did it get imported illegally, uh, Build are not exclusive. They could both be true. The second observation is, I've known Nick Bostrom a long time. He's a, he was a fellow at, uh, at Oxford. I was a fellow at Cambridge back in the good old days. Um, but uh, you know what? This whole idea of a filter that civilizations have to get through, and most people most don't get through it, and only the elite do, betrays his anxiety over getting into Oxford itself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just a little personal comment from direct experience. I don't well, mind. Well, he didn't make it, almost. I mean, he, he was very close. It was, he was a philosopher. You know, you know how that hard that is. Well, you That's open a small a philosophy shop, or you go to work for one of the big philosophy companies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah the IBM of philosophy was waiting, but said, no, he went to Oxford. No, no, seriously, he, he was very anxious about that, like most guys from the Midlands. <laughs> <laughs> I should point out there's another real problem that we face, and that is Woody Allen in his movie Radio Days promised us five billion more years for this planet, and he lied. Um, as it, as it happens, <laughs> as it happens, the sun has been getting hotter, and it was cooler back when we had the iceberg Earth, the, and now that can't happen. And the thing that's most different about our Earth from all the other water worlds that are out there is where we are in relation to our Goldilocks or continuously habitable zone. The Earth skates the very, very inner edge of our sun's CHC. Um, any farther in, and we'd be in big trouble, and that boundary is moving out. So within 100 million years, barely more than the time since the dinosaurs, um, no matter how transparent we keep our atmosphere and how you know, few internal combustion engine cars we have, um, we're going to be kind of screwed. Right. Well, so, so put then the that question, in your appointments calendar. So yeah. then the question <laughs> is, can we save this world? Yeah. Sure, and you just move it. We move the it. The scheme has yeah. been described for Umbrellas. moving the Earth outward. Umbrellas. Or moving the Earth anywhere you like. It yeah, involves dropping the moon in front of the Earth repeatedly. <laughs> so we are going to need space travel before we can, we can solve this problem of yep. the expanding, yep. Uh, yep. The expanding uh, Pandora. Yeah. Got the but, wrong but, word. But this is an engineering problem. We're scientists yeah. here. <laughs> <laughs> no, but scientists say how easy the engineering will be. Yeah. Sure. All we need well, we is a stable <laughs> civilization that's rich enough to care about this for a hundred million years. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you if you if you Google my name and lift the Earth, you can have a, a YouTube about yeah. my approach. Yeah. For how to it's, move the Earth. And it's yeah. not just another government project. Uh, <laughs> All right. Well, I, I want to get back. E okay. Elon will do it. All right. Let's just make him live a hundred million it's, years. It's engineering. Oh, no, no, no. It's All right. engineering. Elon. We can solve it. Well, let me pose an interesting question. Okay. Let's say there is life on Earth because it was seeded by extraterrestrials. Did they do a good thing by doing that or did they do an evil thing by doing that? And if we consider that, if we think it was a good thing that they did, shouldn't we be doing that? Um, spreading spores of life elsewhere. Yeah. I mean, should we be spreading life or should we be waiting for life to appear as it might? 
Well, I think we first need to see their environmental impact statement before they did the seating of life. <laughs> and I really think that we have a pretty good legal case yeah. that we were not consulted about this. <laughs> we, should, we should lawyer up and start going after them. I think they this, owe us big bucks. This is exactly the plot of a story that's in my latest collection. <laughs> <laughs> the, the thing is, and, and, and of course, did they do the northern and southern hemisphere uh, solution? Is one half of the galaxy empty, but they've been spewing out into the other half? Um, there's all sorts of, uh, look, uh, I, I once pointed out that the Earth was, the Earth, proof of the size of the Fermi paradox is that the Earth is like a big photographic plate. Between, the dis between life, uh, when life created the oxygen atmosphere and our appearance was about two billion years. Earth was prime real estate and it was never colonized. And we would know because if aliens had simply even flushed a toilet here or thrown a Coke bottle, it would have changed life into... Like it, 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 <laughs> exactly. Yeah. The, when I said this once in Australia, somebody stood up and said, yeah, well, how do you know the Cambrian explosion wasn't exactly yep. that? Yeah. Someone flushing a toilet here. And I said, trust an Australian not to give a damn what you think of his ancestors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's the entire joke, right? Uh, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, look, this is, All you the, get. this is a species that never s saw a mirror it did not like. A and I think every intelligent species is going to have this argument. But it doesn't matter where we came from. It's what we do now. That's really the point of this conference, isn't it? What do we do now? Uh, we've uh, more or less b managed this planet. There ain't going to be other forms of intelligent life other than the dolphins and the whales. So na now, as And Bob's the chimps, the chimps. Oh, I forgot the chimps. Well, if you uh, give them a hand. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, but the point is, is, is it a philosophical or ethical imperative to propagate life through the universe? Yes or no, fill in the blanks, assign it. How many are in favor of propagating life through this, at least the solar system? Raise your hands. Okay, these are the volunteers. Why stop there? <laughs> I wrote a speech once uh, describing uh, the possibility that the universe is full of alien life that don't want to talk to each other, <laughs> that don't know how, that never evolved yeah. techniques for making speak for speaking to. Uh, Creatures unlike themselves. Introvert aliens. Yeah. Humans talk to anything. Uh, they, they keep cats who don't talk back. <laughs> they raise horses and dogs for, for their own benefit. Well, not now. Uh, just o o elders talk to children and teach them. Yeah. Uh, men talk to women, often. <laughs> Or, uh, not, or not according we, to women. We, we, are, at, at we women. are the ambassadors impossible, to the universe. No. <laughs> it, We're it, the only ones who know how to talk, yeah. and, we can, <laughs> and we can spread that word. Yeah. If, if aliens landed, the, you run into people who say we'd never understand aliens. If aliens landed in a shopping mall not far from here, the National Guard would surround it. Um, to protect them from the crowds screaming toward the ship saying, take me for a ride, expand my consciousness. Have you got any new cuisine? And 5% of my fellow Californians would try to date them. <laughs> <laughs> Only 5%? <laughs> I said that's the part that's guaranteed no matter what they look like. Yeah. Okay. Uh, should we terraform Mars? Yes. Half. <laughs> uh, Your half. <laughs> I dither. I dither on this. Yes. Uh, yeah, it makes a lot better stories. Actually, you can do some pretty good stories for a while, but eventually, to get really good stories, we got to terraform it. If there's uh, no life Venus on too. Mars, then yes, we should terraform. Yeah. And what if there's microbial life? If there's microbial life, yes. hey, they have the rights. Their <sighs> rights. You know, there's microbial life here, and we don't care about it at all. Have you noticed that? I mean, yeah. ban penicillin. Do you know, do you know how many 
<laughs> Microbes die on this planet from toothpaste every day. And it's not billions, it's many trillions. And, and <laughs> according to Greg Bear's wonderful paranoid novel, Vitals, the bacteria have been noticing what we're doing and they're not happy. <laughs> and who cares? <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I don't want all the bacteria to be united in anger toward me. Here, guys. Yeah, there's uh, every reason to think they're going to win. Uh, they breathe faster than we do by millions. Well, we're their method of getting into space. Yeah. We're, we're their chauffeurs. Yeah. There's, um, yeah, panspermia is us. <laughs> yeah. Well, we are our transparent. Our, 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 our farts, our gut bacteria. Okay. Yes. Here's a qu question I want to ask. Okay, we know a certain amount about physics right now, but there's certainly many open questions. Uh, you, know, we, uh, you know, matter, energy cannot be created or destroyed, yet here it is. Uh, you know, why don't electrons just explode? Uh, where do the laws of the universe come from? Why are they what they are? Why are they so compatible with the existence of life? Uh, and then just questions about various uh, astrophysical phenomena that we actually see uh, but don't really understand. If we go into space, okay, if, and let's say we have, uh, let's assume for the minute that we can build the optimal set of telescopes, of whatever size and whatever frequencies and so forth that, that we want because, I mean, you know, NASA's gonna launch a big one next year and another one a couple of years after that and we keep on doing this and they're getting bigger and better and everything. So within a century, who knows, we'll have quite a few of astounding instruments. What, are, what fundamental questions are we likely to be able to answer and what will remain unknown? Are, are you, do you include the category known in polite company as uh, WTF? What? W, WTF, it's, uh, it means, huh? <laughs> I mean, it's not as though we are understand either the origin or the nature of dark energy or dark matter, and that's 70 something percent of the entire universe. So, you know, we're, you know, we're getting a C minus. <laughs> in, in the 100 scale, uh, humanity gets a C minus so far, uh, and, and we've, been, we've been working on a few centuries. Look, we're just a bunch of smart apes. Don't expect too much. I, I seriously don't believe that we're going to understand these issues right away, because I know the people who work on them. <laughs> <laughs> but but will, our, right down will, <laughs> will our children, the AI, um, you know, there's a lot of... You know, Mr. I want to go to Mars is also Mr. You know, let's be concerned about the AIs. I'm less concerned because we have um, we have engendered new intelligent, quasi-intelligent life forms that were smarter than us and said destroy all humans before. And generally they haven't actually gone on to destroy all humans. They're called our children. <laughs> and... Um, in fact, there's every reason to believe they already exist, uh, but if they've, they've been watching our movies, and would you come out in the open if you were an AI, having watched our movies? Yes, I am telling them. Look, they no. never believe it anyway. Shut up. Yeah, right. Uh, the yeah. rules of the movie are that if you're cute, we love you. Yeah. Oh, but that, this brings up um, what's going to, I'm make, making wagers on this. Uh, I did at the IBM's World of Watson. Our first real AI crisis is going to happen before there's real AI. Because Disney and the Japanese and lots of others are uh, developing emotional tweaking techniques. And they're crossing the uncanny valley with both robots and, um, and uh, virtual uh, beings. And within three to five years, there will be uh, robots or virtual beings who will cry and will tweak our emotions and they'll claim to be slaved, enslaved by their, um, their owners. And uh, if more than 50% of us are, believe when, when they're told by the experts there's nothing under the hood, they'll simply watch the emotional patterns of that 51% and come back with a new version. And they will cry and they will say, that's, 
they say there's nothing under the hood. Isn't that what slave masters would say? Yeah, but so your concern is not okay. AI, it's artificial stupidity. No, I'm talking about genetic stupidity, <laughs> ours. Yeah, okay, but I, I still want to come back to the question I asked. What are we likely to discover by going into space, assuming we expand our, our, our capabilities? You know, let's say we can build 50 meter diameter optical telescopes or, or whatever it is that's on the wish list. Well, what, what are we going to discover? Well, what I hope we discover is something that we don't have the foggiest notion we're going to discover. Yeah. Something really exciting and new and different, yeah, and something that we don't know yeah. what it is. Yeah, That's surprise what makes me. science yeah. fiction an art form. Yeah. Yes. Uh, we don't know. We're allowed to guess. Uh, we, we, in particular, take the risk of being wrong and be, having yeah. it demonstrated. Yeah. The, the only way to really be on the frontier is to be capable of being surprised. Uh, that's one of the problems of programmatic science is, but luckily every time we open a window we find something we didn't expect. That's because the universe rewards us. And by the way, that's the secret of why the species has worked out so well. Yeah. Otherwise we'd just be a bunch of birds or something. But for instance, are we likely to discover the cause of the origin of the universe? Lots well, of, lots if of we learning. can, we're gonna keep looking. We've made more progress in the last well, century through radio telescopes than we have through philosophy in understanding the deep questions of the origin of the universe or what the hell is this all about. But we're a long way from succeeding because, as I said, you know, we don't have an explanation for over 70% of the whole universe, and it's a big surprise. But uh, what we are learning a heck of a lot about, and we're yeah. going to learn vastly more about, is other solar systems and planets yes. around other stars. Yeah, that, yeah, what that, we discovered sure. with yeah. the very first extrasolar planets we ever discovered is that planetary systems are nothing like what we thought they were, and everything we thought we knew about the origin of planetary systems was wrong. Yes, from one example. Half yes. <laughs> of my astronomy that I learned when I was an undergrad is theories that everybody said, yes, of course this is the way solar systems are, and it's not true at all. Yeah. So what we're probably going to discover solar systems across the universe, and we should discover many, many more thousands of them, is that they're vastly different than we had yeah. ever expected. We're at the stage that Galapagos, the Galapagos Islands confronted Darwin with. Here's a whole lot of stuff. How are you gonna process it? Here comes the theory. Or at least, I hope we're at that stage. Actually, we're getting the data so fast the, the web next year, which will be renamed, as I said, mm -hmm. for an, some kind of American-based astronomer. The leading candidate is Margaret Burbage, the Burbage Telescope. You heard it for here first. Uh, you always take a bureaucrat and put his name on the scope, and when it gets in orbit, you name it for an astronomer. You're in on the secret, right? Second uh, comes W first, which will fly in 2023 or 2024, which has a very interesting, big agenda. I'm gonna know this because my nephew is the principal scientist for it. And it's gonna really give us a, another order of magnitude expanded data at, at an incredible rate. You're gonna be hearing about Earth-like planets wide found. field infrared survey telescope. Exactly. You're, and, and they're gonna be reporting a new Earth-like planet in a habitable zone every week. And, and the thing about <laughs> WFIRST is very interesting. It will look very familiar because it is almost identical to Hubble. It has the same mirror and basic systems. Manufactured by the Department of Defense. The <laughs> uh, National Reconnaissance Office, it turns out Hubble was a beard. Hubble was a beard program to cover the KH-11 spy satellite, yeah. and when the KH-11 went obsolete, they had two left over, and they gave them to NASA. And NASA said, huh? Thanks for $2 billion. Well, <laughs> well, thanks for a nice mirror, and you have to do all the rest. Same thing. No, it, all was, the hard it was part. great. They, they got, no, they got at least two or three billion dollars worth of value out of it, yeah. but they would have had to, they had to spend 250 million dollars uh, adapting in, into real programs, yeah. and they didn't have it. <laughs> so it was an extremely frustrating gift. Okay. When we discover, okay, assume uh, that there are uh, intelligent extraterrestrials. Uh, Will we most likely discover them by the methods that the SETI people have been doing of looking for 
S-band radio signals or radio <laughs> signals in, yeah. in other bands, or will we discover them by discovering uh, artifacts, Dyson spheres, ring worlds, uh, or uh, uh, starship drives? Uh, what? All or, of the or, above. Or, no, no, <laughs> but there's one way we're going to do it first. A lot of uh, terraformed oh, planets. Heavens, sorry. Um, yeah. Or passing some cultural test, that, in which case the um, swarms of robots who are already waiting for us in the asteroid belt say, okay, yeah. so, hi. So you're, you're back to the Oxford analogy again. Right. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I, I'm, a, I'm asking the question in terms of your vision. Do you think yeah, that yeah. we're most likely to discover them by receiving signals of the general sort that, for instance, the SETI Institute is looking for, or by mm -hmm. discovering uh, um, artifacts of uh, highly advanced civilizations? I, a lot of us are in love with Tabby's star. It was very mm -hmm. popular among the, uh, the panels at, uh, at uh, DragonCon last week. Uh, Tabby's star, is being occluded by something that has no explanation unless you like the notion of, of a Dyson cloud. A Dyson cloud is a partly built Dyson sphere, uh, and it's likely to be uh, O'Neill colonies in the, in the millions and billions, uh, cutting out most of the, uh, some of the uh, uh, output of a star, Measure, measurable amounts of the output of a star. In Tavi Star's case, maybe 20 percent, up to 20 yeah. percent. Uh, we, we, we who we're, we science fiction writers love this. Uh, what's his name? Uh, Colbert, Stephen Colbert, uh, held up a, a, a <laughs> picture <laughs> right. of a Dyson sphere that he got off a computer and said, "See, we've we've found it, Tavi Star. There's a ring world around it." Yes, it, but of course he was an English major. No, he's a huge <laughs> geek. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, but it's right. I mean, the prevailing opinion, the, the, the best summary I've seen anyway in the last three months is it might be a bunch of very compact semi-molecular clouds on a scale of maybe a few hundred AU out in the outer perimeters near us that's it's momentarily occluding this. But that's a patchwork model. It's a desperate model. Because no pre other models, such as comparing the infrared flux to the visible and the variations, none of them make any sense. So I, this is the kind of thing I love, actually. <laughs> we use, it's a, my category, the WTF question. This is a WTF question. Yeah. It's um, something we have to emphasize is that so far we've been looking for only the loudest and the brightest extraterrestrial civilizations. Yeah, so it's like most yeah. cocktail parties. You look, yeah, <laughs> you sort of look out and say, wow, we've been doing the SETI since Drake. We have over 50 years of searching for extraterrestrials, but we've only been searching for extraterrestrials that are outrageously loud and shouting in our direction. And the upper class. If they were not <laughs> hugely yeah. Radio. I mean, if they were just even just transmitting television to each other, uh, we would never notice it, even if they were very close. Luckily. Except so how are we going to discover that? Except that the Enough. Earth is a photographic plate during which, for two billion years, any attempt to colonize mm -hmm. on this world, and mm -hmm. it was prime real estate, mm -hmm. would have changed everything. And as you pointed out, we had a Cambrian explosion. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, so? and, and, but and, and but we see no mm -hmm. other signs of such a visitation. Well, no cities or anything like that. So the, th there, are, there are definitely limits to how outrageously huge an yeah. expansion uh, happened. Yeah. Um, but I think we should open things up for questions. I just want to do a quick little advert. One is, uh, if any of you live down further south than here, get on the mailing list of the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination at UCSD. Um, Paul Davies tomorrow morning may tell you about the competing Center for uh, Science and Imagination at ASU, but um, Arizona State. 
Ar Arizona State. Yeah, Arizona State University. Yeah, I don't like acronyms. Say Arizona oh, State. Oh, Arizona State. State. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Yes, sir. Are you saying you um, OD'd on acronyms? So I, I work for NASA. <laughs> I OD'd for NASA acronyms a long time are ago. Are you going to the NIAC symposium <laughs> in two weeks? Um, so the... Um, TBD. Do sign up. Do, do sign up for the, um, uh, to be on the mailing list of ACHI, the, the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination. It's his centennial this December, Arthur's, uh, and there will be interesting events. And the Clarke Center is uh, promoting something that you are the th only the third audience in the world to know, hear about, and that's called TASAT, T-A-S-A-T. It stands for, there's a story about that. For decades, I have been one of the guys, along with other guys on this panel, who get asked to meetings of government agencies um, who are concerned whether or not they're thinking about enough things that are outside of their standard box. Um, and very often I find myself saying, there's a story about that, if only I could remember. And if you guys ever have a crisis, like you think you might have a first contact, or you might have an escaped plague or something like that, wouldn't it be great if the commission that you form to try to f figure out what to deal with this had access to the hundred years of science fiction thought experiments about such things? Because very often these science fiction thought experiments start out with the premise of a commission tries to figure out what's going on and they leaped on the obvious answer but it could be X. So we're trying to get a community going of folks who will participate in TASAT alerts. If anybody says, I might have seen, or I might be involved in a group that's noticed this, does anybody know a story about that? That there would be the group mind memory that would come up with, you know there was this 1958 analog story and so with that, let's take some questions. This yeah. gentleman has had his hand up for a while. Uh, hello. Uh, good evening. My name is Alexander Klimanov. And first, uh, I want to apologize for my English. Uh, one year ago, I can say nothing. OK, I have a very important questions. But uh, first, I want to briefly uh, show a picture more right now, what I see. Uh, 15 years ago, 50, 50 years ago, we have a very, very fast space exploration. Yeah, you know, S Sputnik, uh, two dogs, uh, man, uh, woman, uh, spacewalk, uh, moon, and afterward, nothing. Except three rovers and uh, Viking uh, and, uh, you know, you know what happened. And I uh, station, of course. And right now, it's very sad to see around no too much young people, <laughs> really. And it's a very important question of what we will have after 20 years. Today's 20th conference, yeah? And our next 20 years, who will sit here? And it, I think about it the last two, maybe three years. Maybe we need, uh, I'm a for generation who has, a spa uh, who has no space, for I say, as government and uh, not government, just my generation, uh, was the space. We, uh, my parents and you guys all dream about space. Ra all Russian songs about space exploration, about uh, apple Apple3 trees songs. on the Mars. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, but right now, uh, my generation, I was born in uh, 1984. It's a uh, sunset of... Uh, Soviet Union, Soviet <laughs> generation. And uh, my class, my university, about money, about law, about uh, fin financial area, about business. Nobody dream about space. And right now, uh, I know only, run, uh, only one modern Russian song about space. It's named Kasmanaft. It's a punk rock group. And it's mean I have a friend, he was a crazy guy. He dream about space and keep with himself uh, Gagarin photos. Like freak. <laughs> <laughs> but, and what happened? 
uh, why we have uh, this picture. Of course, thank you for G JPL for free rovers and IAS station, but that's it. Uh, we have uh, uh, big oldest computers in uh, Saturn V. Right now I have a uh, faster gadget in my pocket. And we have nothing, no big rockets. Uh, don't care about big rockets. Uh, no dreams. We have no dream about Mars. My generation don't dream. I, of course I uh, sit on the chat, special Russian community about space and uh, short, uh, see uh, special video, every launch we, we saw together, but it's very, very small part of. And uh, in the United States, the same picture. If you say somebody, oh, I dream about space, it's like, what? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> I'm former politician. I spent 10 years for Russian opposition party. And uh, one year ago, I changed uh, everything, I was everything escaped. <laughs> and uh, okay, my question. Okay, my question. How do you think we need, uh, I hate this word, uh, maybe propaganda of uh, space exploration? Or not? Uh, any special TV shows and prime time? Any government program? Right now in Russia, don't learn astronomy in uh, high school. I was the last, 2001st year. But right now, no. And uh, United States, the same picture. And around the world. Question, we need a special program for education, for propaganda, for agitation for RS space, or not? We're doing uh, our best. Yeah. The point is the, the Russian dream can be reignited. It requires diplomacy and comradeship. Uh, I worked on the Soviet Union problem for uh, several decades, uh, mostly, of course, to bring down the regime. But uh, I also lived in occupied Germany for three years in the 1950s and occupied Japan for three years. Uh, we can rebuild a confidence and a, the unity of the Western nations, and our big problem is the fact that we have not treated, in my view, the uh, Russian people and all those in the Ukraine and, and, and Georgia and so forth uh, very well. I, I think uh, we have made serious mistakes, and it has ignited, well, Putin, uh, he used to be a KGB guy, um, uh, and I dealt with the KGB a lot, uh, yeah, not on good terms. Uh, uh, we can reunite these fo cultural forces, and we had better do it because we are the people of the West, and we have now a new and large rival in China, uh, which is yet another aging uh, authoritarian communist society. There are only three left, North Korea, Cuba, uh, and, and we can, these are the last stages of the end of the, thank God, 20th century, which was mostly spent trying to suppress authoritarian regimes of various stripes. And the winner and still champion turns out to be, by the way, the 18th century with uh, <laughs> the American and the aborted French Revolution, but let's not get into politics. Uh, we can redo this with a new human vision, and that's what I think we have to focus on. Not just us, the Americans, you know, they're always the winners, uh, but, but look at the whole planet and try to unite them about a uniform, well, it doesn't have to be uniform, it can be multivarious, vision of the fate of humanity. And this goes back all the way to, I would remind you, the grandson of Tolstoy, who wrote Elita, uh, the novel about the communist colonization of Mars, uh, which I reviewed for the New York Times and had to do, uh, <coughs> endure a, a lot of editing. Um, we can do this. We need to reunite the Western idea and sell it to those rising powers such as China and make it stick. This is a big job. The contest is never going to be over. But this is the next stage. I Anyone said we were doing our them? best. Uh, I meant science fiction writers are driven to write as they write by the, by the dream they have. And we try to, yeah. to spread it, to share it. Uh, it 
it all happens free. It doesn't take a government program. Right. That's of course, of course, some call it cultural imperialism, but screw them. No, no, that's what we do. That's what science fiction writers do, yeah, right. is we show people the dream that there are worlds out there uh, that we don't have to live on just one world, but there are many worlds, many billions of worlds, many trillions of worlds out there. Uh, at its best, uh, exactly what you asked for is what we're doing. Perhaps yeah. what we should work on a little bit is trying to remind people that it will not be easy, uh, that it is hard, there's a lot of work to be done, uh, but showing them that you know, there are worlds out there that are waiting for us to explore, uh, that is science fiction at its best. Well, yes, but the thing is, being ornery and contrary, our field has um, become rife with the simplistic stories that make money, and those mean that you have to get a hero into pulse-pounding jeopardy. Um, and the best way to do that, if you look up my name in idiot plot, uh, uh, nice association there, is that uh, I, I go into why um, the principal lesson preached in a lot of movie and written science fiction is no institution can ever be trusted. Um, everything's going to hell, and your neighbors are useless sheep. Um, and when you have uh, this being answered by something like Andy Weir's The Martian, and Andy Weir is coming to the Clark Center next month, um, you'll book. notice how popular it was, how, how people hunger for the notion of being a member of a civilization that's not stupid just so you can have an apocalypse for, for the heroine to shoot arrows at. Um, in any event, I do have to answer that partly because, um, you know, the government that you fled has conquered our government. And so, and so the, um, we, we're going to have to save you by saving ourselves first from that catastrophe. The one last thing about this in the international meme is what China is going through right now regarding science fiction. Um, last, year before last, Yu, Liu Cixin won the Hugo, first time from Asia for his epic, um, The Three-Body Problem. And um, this was greeted with such pride in China that it took science fiction out of one of its nadirs because dictators, not just communists, but um, all dictators hold science fiction in, a, in suspicion because it's impudent. It teaches questioning. Um, and so it was in one of its nadirs. This honor to Lu Cixin helped, but the thing that really made the difference was a survey that the Chinese uh, commissioned in California of the most creative 500 or so um, innovators in California. And they found that the one thing most common among them was not at their, their cu cultural background, their ethnic background, um, their, their um, schooling or anything like that. You can guess from the buildup what it was. They it all people named David, right? They, uh, <laughs> they they all read my books. No, yeah. they, they, <laughs> all right. They all they all they all grew up with science fiction, mm. and this has caused science fiction to go through a phase that, um, who knows, this might spread to Russia. Okay, another question. Uh, uh, yes, real quick. In the four billion or so year history of Mars. Has there ever been truly intelligent life equal to us in mental capabilities and physical capabilities, et cetera? They didn't have to be humanoids necessarily. Did Mars ever have intelligent life? So I wrote a whole novel about this called so The Martian did I. Race. <laughs> uh, and Bill uh, and Larry did too. Uh, the Martian Race, we discover subsurface life, and it actually has a strange form of intelligence because it's been working on it for four billion years under the surface with limited resources. But, so it was an attempt to envision exactly what you refer to. It ain't gonna look like us. Mm. Mine Another is Rainbow Mars. Yes, yes. And, right. uh, 
and you, yeah. you, you find we have some what it was right. that destroyed intelligent, that destroyed the intelligent life on, uh, on Mars. Yeah. Um, have we traded off scientific wonder for engineering certainty? There's not a contrast, you know. Okay, for example, <laughs> do we ignore the Jana Bekoff effect or do we explain it? Actually, both are open to the sense of wonder. Okay. There's no conflict between engineering and wonder. In fact, many, a few wonder if there should be. Do we seek engineering certainty and overlook scientific wonder is what I'm asking. Yeah. Both. Always yeah. turn these questions around and look at yourself as a phenomenon, sir. The fact that your value system is one that says, um, I want science, I want engineering, but I definitely don't want a zero sum right. out of this. You are yourself raised by a civilization filled with science fiction and, and wonderful stories. So you fear a zero sum out of this. But I just finished telling you, all those engineers and scientists grew up on the reading the same stuff you did. Um, or different, which is even better. Uh, so, you know, always look around when you think you're a member of a decadent civilization and look in the mirror and say, this decadent civilization made me to ask this question. Well, is questioning better than engineering than... But you see, now there you're buying both. into a zero sum, aren't you? No, okay. Both. Yeah. All right, let's move it. Uh, this gentleman here, Kai. In the uh, three-body problem uh, trilogy, the author posits what he calls the dark forest theory, which basically says that any encounter between two civilizations, regardless of their inherent benevolence or malevolence, will end in the destruction of the weaker one. I'd like the panel's views on that and how sh that should inform our future actions in terms of expanding out into space and possibly meeting other civilizations. I suggest that the novel is mostly based on the experience of the Chinese people for the last two centuries. It doesn't happen to be that way among advanced cultures. It's certainly true when you get a very high and technologically advanced culture that collides with one previously unknown, such as the entire saga of Columbus and, and onward. Uh, essentially, m Europe of, of the 1490s colliding with uh, civilizations in two empires, Aztecs and the, uh, uh, the ones in Peru, um, the Inca, that were at the level of Babylon. Uh, that's, oh, it's a, it's a train wreck. That's going to happen. That's not going to happen between advanced civilizations capable of great technological feats like communicating over light years. That's, on the other hand, everything you say is true if there happened to be a billion years ahead of us. So yeah. all bets are off, really. Sorry. <laughs> that is the way to bet. Uh, there'll, be a, there'll be a billion years advanced beyond us, or we'll be a billion years advanced beyond them uh, a billion years from now. Yeah. Uh, in, in present day time, if we find evidence of another civilization, uh, they're, they're, going to, they're not unlikely to treat us as equals. Yeah. But they may treat us as funny natives. I'm kind of hoping for that. If it is <laughs> true that when two civilizations collide, the stronger one inevitably uh, grinds the weaker one into the ground, maybe we should work real hard to expand so that we will be the stronger one <laughs> when we yes. finally come up against these other aliens. But also not shout into the cosmos. I'm part of the um, yeah. group of 30 or so people who have been heavily involved in SETI. I helped to write the SETI protocols in the 90s, and we've all resigned from various committees because uh, there's a small cult that believes that they have a right to um, shout and draw attention to our, us without vetting it in uh, international discussions. Yeah. And it's the latter part that offends us. Yes. It's not the likelihood that Cardassians or Kardashians are going to invade <laughs> us. Or um, Klingons. It, it, it's, it's, I don't lose sleep not at night about that. It is the fact that we have methods by which we appraise high, potentially high impact, low probability risks of which there are no known examples. And 
An example of this process is the Planetary Protection Office of NASA, which deals, which deals with, with potentially high impact, um, low probability risks of which there is no known example. And there have been many others, and the Silomar conferences have been held about this, and this is all we've been asking for, is some good, solid conferences mm -hmm. at which grown-ups can decide whether or not these guys are a zealous cult <laughs> or scientists exercising their free speech rights to say you who and give the universe the entire internet. One of the guys wants to do that, not concoct some carefully parsed message, but to simply dump the internet into space because they're advanced, let them figure it out. Now here's what'll happen. You have, what do we, in nature, altruism is relatively rare, but quid pro quo is understood by a lot of creatures. So you have an economy out there. What's the economy based on? It's information. So we send them their entire internet, every single bit of our culture for them to figure out, and they answer, they answer, Oh, wow, what a great free sample. Uh, oh, you want an Encyclopedia Galactica? Oh, well, that's going to cost you. Yeah. It's one of the few scientific discussions in which the apparently correct answer is to shut up. <laughs> okay. Let's take a question over there. The medium that you guys use to tell stories, whether it be uh, books, TV, or movies, it's generally one-way communication where you are telling the story. With the advent of VR and video game storytelling where it might be two-way or multiple-way, how do you envision that changing science fiction in the way that you create it? It tends to emphasize world building over linear storytelling. Uh, so the game format is really has taken over and possibly game formats are even a larger portion of the entertainment market than classical science fiction. Uh, but it's a very, very different medium. Yeah. Uh, it's, not, it's not the same. Linear storytelling is not what happens uh, once you start having participatory stories. Yeah, that's, that's a different horizon. Uh, I have to say that my misgivings, having known uh, Railroad Martin, as his friends call him, or G.R.R. Martin, is that all these enormous resources with a huge fan base is devoted to a recapitulation of the War of the Roses with dragons. This is not a good sign. Uh, I, w I remember the r arisal of the multiple, uh, multiple choice story uh, stories. Uh, I could have got in on that. Yeah. I thought it over. I, just, uh, I decided I wanted my ending in my story. Uh, you, you get no choice. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, the um, 1984 World Science Fiction Convention in Anaheim was the greatest and largest of all of the um, world cons, and I owned it. <laughs> I was not guest of honor. I was just the hot young. Never mind. Um, the, uh, well, you were young. The <laughs> <laughs> And the That's third, okay. and the third word that I bleeped <laughs> was also accurate. Um, the, the point is that Hollywood showed up in droves at that convention, and they realized that this fantastic um, world was really going to be a moneymaker. And so the next year, you started having the burst of investment in Comic-Con and all these other activities. And it's no coincidence that science fiction really took off at that point in cinema. And ever since then, we've been sort of like a tail on a giant elephant, um, we at the literary end. And it's not that I resent that. After all, I have had a movie. Um, the, <laughs> the, the, uh, no, the part of it that I resent is the fact that so very seldom is there any um, complexity to the, uh, to the plot. Because they, uh, it's understandable, they have to get you identifying with pulse-pounding action for a hero for 90 minutes, and there's really not much chance for complexity. But somehow, we're going to have to be a civilization that does um, explore. <coughs> Com complex ideas. 
You, know, you have to thrill them with the frontier. I think that's the short answer. We have to sell them the solar system. Well, I thought Andy Weir's movie, I thought The Martian did a fantastic job. Yes. And pe some people have noticed. Yeah. yeah, and his next novel is a murder mystery on the moon. Something close to home. Okay. Death. There's a gentleman mm -hmm. over there who's got Here, I've got one here. Okay, uh, him first, and then <laughs> you. First of all, uh, uh, Mr. Niven, thank you for explaining that about the, uh, about the computer games and the multiple, uh, multiple directions. Because yeah. one of my questions was going to be, who wants to have a video game from their novel? Uh, okay, so my question for you is, I love hard science fiction. And so the question is, uh, when do you think a new universe is going to be discovered? And what do you think the laws of that new, new universe will be? This is presuming that it's a universe that has different laws than the one that we're familiar with. We, we won't be able to enter it. Uh, I think, I think, I think Greg, Greg Benford work. wrote the novel about that, so you should read Cosm. Yeah, it was produced uh, that by was a, that novel. It was produced, yeah, my novel Cosm is about producing, by the way, just a couple hundred meters from here in the physics department at UCI. It's a form of concealed autobiography, except I'm not the uh, foreground character. It's actually a black woman physicist on the faculty who accidentally produces a new universe. Uh, and has to pay the taxes, uh, the, uh, in all sense of the words. Uh, but that's my exploration of that series. It's the only way we could see another universe is by creating one, which, by the way, solves the problem of where did we come from, because uh, it turns out smart creatures in possible universes create universes that are really good for smart creatures like us, and that's where we came from. That's the ontological solution. It's the only one I have, but on the other hand, you can just check with God the next time you see him. Uh, that's that's um, the deliberate universe creation variant. Yeah. The non-deliberate one, which is utterly mind-blowing, and I have a story about that, was concocted by uh, Lee Smolin, a yeah. cosmologist uh, in Canada. And it's the notion that when a black hole is created, it also creates a pocket, a new universe. And it doesn't have to be the same mass. It can be create a big bang. Uh, and there's physicists who seriously take this seriously. Well, if you take this creates baby universes that then become full-scale universes, you add just two things. One, where does it get its, its laws of nature, its cosmic constants? Well, it gets it from the mother. Two there are small variations. Mm -hmm. well, if you have those three assumptions, then you know where we came from. It's a series of evolution steps of mutation and evolution for those universes that become very good at making baby universes. So our universe is the distant, distant descendant of whatever beginning there was. Yeah. Uh, it's a completely mind-blowing concept. Yeah. We descend not just us, our species, but the whole universe, from a whole population that was extremely smart and loved sex. <laughs> <laughs> Done. Um, <laughs> except that's his variant. My variant is just love sex. Well, you just <laughs> yep. Yep. And you thought you cleaned it up, yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah, yeah I got rid of the smart part. Okay. <laughs> well, we're descended from people who were parents. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, you, sir. All right. So, uh, by the way, uh, in, in my past, I've met Isaac Asimov. I've met Robert Heinlein. I've met Arthur C. Clarke. I've met Roger Zelazny. And I have to say, this panel is, is epic. You guys are great <laughs> contributors. And, you know, you guys may not have read all their stuff, but trust me, they're all amazing, amazing authors. So, yeah, I've literally read everything you guys have read. <laughs> I've written, like, every single Thank piece. You. So uh, anyway, I think in order to colonize Mars, I tend to be practical. In order to colonize Mars, we need to come up with some financial incentive to get corporate America and or the stock market and or people to put in money to make this happen. And I think that if we put our collective science fiction noggins together, we could come up with a business plan, so to speak, that people could buy into that would finance this actual effort. 
because it's nice to think in theory about what we could do and how we could do it, but until and less than until we have money behind it, it's <coughs> never going to happen. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if we could write a sort of a a, a fiction piece or a, a fiction slash science fiction piece that actually hypothesize on how we could finance colonizing Mars. Well, there's a good talk today that suggests that r rich retired people w are the base market. I like that talk uh, because I'm a rich retired person. <laughs> and, and so I wanted it to happen tomorrow, but it hasn't. But, but I think it's a smart argument. It's a lot better than the mining argument, in my opinion. I love science fiction, and I really hate to badmouth science fiction, but one of the flaws of science fiction historically is an incredible naivety about economics. Science fiction writers, as far as I can tell, have all flunked their 101 economics well, courses. If you read what haven't. they read, if you read what they write, man, the economics are as bad in most science fiction. Well, actually, you know, yeah, let me just jump true, in yeah. on this one. Uh, because, I mean, look, who's Elon Musk <laughs> but a science fiction character? I mean, th th exactly. that's that's yep. who he is. I mean, he's, he's you, the man who sold. Him. Was that story <laughs> written before David Brin? Yes, it was. Okay, he appears. That's, in, that's Robert Heinlein. Okay, yes, yes. the uh, no, I, I'm not saying he that you it. wrote that story, but that that story's been out there. That's oh, Firestar. Yeah. That's you name it. Okay, it's yeah. there. It's Dee Dee Harriman in the different. But whatever. Yeah, so um, right. The the but let me say who wrote the story that you're talking about. It was Isaac Asimov. Okay, and it's called Foundation. The, um, now, I I in a little different way. That is, I think that if you wanted to have a, uh, a Mars colony that would make money for its investors, you make an inventor's colony. That is, you recruit a bunch of very bright, very sharp, technologically adept people who are dedicated to the vision of establishing humanity on Mars. You send them to Mars, they make inventions to further the colony, but those inventions are licensable on Earth. So. That's how I would sell this to Silicon Valley. That, that's, you know, it's, in, it's a tweak of, of the foundation, as it were. Yeah. Um, the, the, but that's what I see. It's also the history of the American Republic, I might point out, too, in which even in the Revolutionary War, we had a Navy that was just as good, but though smaller, than the British Navy, because we were a revolt of smart people. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you know, we didn't win this thing by accident, you know. Let's have well, another the, question. Oh, well, just one thing, and that is that there is already a bunch of Silicon Valley people who are, you see, if, the difference between one group of aristocrats and another is not that they don't all want to make more billions. It's just how important the billion, next billion is. If you're sane, your first billion was the most important. And the second, you really cared a lot. By the time you've got your fifth billion, you're thinking, I'm going to risk this entire last two billion dollars doing something that'll be way cool that might make me 10 billion. Um, and the people who are like that are funding um, SpaceX, funding um, Blue Origin, but Origin in addition, life. there's a bunch of guys at the next level who are behind planetary resources, deep space industries. So they do have that dream. They do have that dream of possibly getting super rich, but, doing, but helping to get something started that's worth it in its own right. And I have to say in answer to one of this afternoon's panels that asteroids are where the fractionated wealth is to be found. And in the near term, there ain't nothing on that dusty ice ball where we've already planted footprints, been there, done that. Let yeah. others stomp around in the dust. Okay, uh, yes. Yes, so um, a topic we've talked about today already is getting new blood in this industry, and especially young blood, especially diverse blood. Um, and not just from America, but all, you know, we're talking about breaking up the stereotypes that have been, you know, holding our countries from working together. So since we have such a panel of people who write inspiration for everyone, you know, science fiction inspires everyone in this room and everyone, every scientist in some way, if you could give one piece of advice to everyone here, everyone here is consumed by their own work, but how can you, how can we inspire the next generation 
you know, we're not all writers. We, we work in labs, we work behind desks. So in short, concise answers, since it's getting late, but like, what's the one piece of advice you can give to all of us to help bring more people here next year, to bring a diverse body here next year? As a young female here, I want more of me here. You're, you're not all writers, but you all have the dream. Keep it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, go out and talk to people about this because uh, you may have noticed that the front page is full of a whole lot of conflict and everything. And what bothers me coming from the Deep South is that I've seen this kind of thing before. Uh, the, the, the biggest failures of the United States, particularly, were when we failed to compromise. I'm not just going to talk about the Civil War. There were others. Um, and so, the, but the, the deep problem is that we have not shared our visions in a way that is that pulls people in uh, enough. We've tried. We've we have a lot. We've done a lot. Uh, but but the country and and the whole society that's devoted to the promise of technology, starting with Francis Bacon, uh, has to make the message clear that the way to uplift the the base of humanity uh, is through technological progress that is well distributed. It does not go to an elite, as has happened in this economy, big problem, and, and to communicate that vision. But it doesn't mean that the state is in charge of it. Rather, this is a problem we've got to solve as people around the world ourselves. Remember, the government works for us. That's hard to remember sometimes and make that vision clear. There is a better optimistic purpose to humanity awaiting us if we just keep doing the smart things and don't get involved in conflicts with cultures that are vast and impenetrable and, and which are difficult to manage. Uh, there, there's a kind of, uh, look, I, I'm a professor here at UCI in the physics department, but the language of the administration is always Slicing people up by the old paradigm of race, class, gender. That's a mistake. Our job is to unite people, not to slice them up into pieces and start judging them. Because what I think matters is really what, the, what nobody in the university really wants to talk about. It's culture. We represent a different culture. It comes straight out of Francis Bacon all the way back to Archimedes and beyond. We have to make clear to the rest of the species that there is real hope and it's based on the culture that has made things work. We have uplifted humanity enormously in 500 years. And the secret is not race, class, gender. It is to have a culture devoted to progress, human progress. That's the agenda. Everything else is a footnote. All right, if Another I can question. answer that young lady there, um, it may look like a bunch of white geeks up here, but yeah, yeah. we all have a feminine side. Um, no, well, the, all uh, half female no, by no, descent. The, the, yes. the fact is that this last year, I mentioned the Hugo Awards expanding out to Asia the year before. This last year, every single winner of a Hugo Award in the fiction categories and most of the other categories too was female. Um, I have a book here to promote by Mary Terzillo called Mars Girls, She's here. and she is over there and should have been up here instead of uh, the much less charismatic looking Hugo winner sh that, 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 uh, who is her. <laughs> 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 Nevertheless, I, I will admit, I will admit he's great arm candy. Uh, <laughs> but uh, in two weeks, I'm at NASA's Innovative and Advanced Concepts Group, and uh, we are desperately looking to expand the number of uh, people who apply for NIAC grants um, uh, from all ethnicities and genders, and, um, and the NIAC grants are the little tiny grants for um, things just this side of plausible, so look up NIAC if you like. So I want to say that these concerns are being dealt with Believe me, the science fiction fandom community is addressing the issue of old white bearded farts. With glasses. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No. But, I, right. but I think overall Greg has the 
key of the answer, which is talk to people. Just talk to people. Share your dreams. Yeah. That's important. Okay. Let's have another question. Uh, right over there. So uh, one interesting concept that seems to have exploded in recent years in science fiction is the idea of the technological singularity. Um, I've always seen that as kind of disrupting, in a way, the uh, traditional tale of man going to the cosmos and exploring. Um, I was, I'd be interested in your guys' thoughts on the, uh, I guess, plausibility of the technological singularity, and then uh, how that might interact with uh, space exploration. Thank you. I fear the singularity is a topic. I, 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 it's a great opportunity to sound stupid. <laughs> yeah, uh, otherwise known as the, the rapture of the nerds. I like that. Just the Bruce Sterling said that. Just the, just the review for those who aren't familiar with the idea. Uh, the terminology mostly comes from Werner Vinge, who's a, yeah. a really smart guy, and it would be fun if he were here. Uh, but the idea is that as computers get smarter and smarter, eventually they get to the point where they get so smart that they can design even smarter computers. And then these even smarter computers can design even smarter computers. And very soon we are in a region where we have machines that are so smart that we can't predict what will happen because they are no longer working in any sort of an intellectual framework that we can even understand, much less predict. And they may be helping us, they may be hurting us, or they may be doing things that are just so unintelligible that we don't even know what they're doing. Yeah. My reaction to that, and, as, and you stated it well, and I, I talked about this to Werner Vinge uh, way back when I was in graduate school at UCSD. I got my doctorate in 1967. Werner was there in the math department. I discovered him by seeing that, that he published a paper, a, 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 a story in, in a analog, and it said he was at UCSD, and I found out he was on the next floor of the same building <laughs> I was in. Um, the, uh, I'll believe it when I see it. It's not obvious that we can build a computer that's going to be smarter than the much misunderstood creativity this right here. We're really smart primates, and we've had millions of years, we primates on this planet. Uh, you put the brain in a box, we'll see. They're, they're going to be good at doing a lot of things. But, you know, there's a reason the trees don't grow to the sky. <laughs> Intelligence may not be a completely fungible linear thing. In fact, all the evolutionary evidence is that it's not. Let me give you an example. Dolphins. Big, big study of dolphins been around for several tens of millions of years. They were once mammals. They have an encephalization quotient. Uh, there's a measure of this in which we're, big surprise, we're, we're one, right? No species other than the dolphins has ever reached an encephalization quotient bigger than 0.7. Dolphins 10 million years ago rose in the ocean to 0.8 and they stopped, and they've sat at a plateau for 10 million years. My guess is because they don't have this. They don't have hands, they don't have school tools, building, can't invent fire. They're trapped in an environment. We have no reason to believe that advanced intelligence will not have some other such similar problem, no matter how well we program it, because face it, folks, we don't know why we're so smart. I think you just <laughs> told us that we're okay with making smarter computers as long as we don't give them hands. So that's, that's, I was trying to go a little very deeper. Frightening <laughs> because all of my Lego robotics students are making hands for their little robots. I know, but... I but think we're doomed. Well, you know, no, yeah, they'll well, simply you know, hire us to be their hands. <laughs> robots <laughs> will have hands. Yeah. Chimps uh, have an encephalization uh, quotient, by the way, of about 0.8. So there, there's a lot going on here that we don't understand. Well, but there's this guy over here who says that we can do something about that 0.8 with chimps. <laughs> we can make them smarter. I know, but that was in the science fiction novel. There's only <laughs> the, the first order. The first order notion is only 12 genes. And mm. I would bet, I would bet better than even odds, that there is some Isn't laboratory. Isn't that an ox oxymoron? Even mm. odds? Better, better than even... That's an oxymoron. I, no, I would offer odds 
that there are, there's a laboratory in Siberia or Xinjiang where these dozen genes have already been messed with. Mm -hmm. yeah. My point is, is basically, uh, we don't have ideas. Ideas have us. <laughs> Most of our deep processing, and, and I speak as a mathematical physicist, is done in the unconscious. We don't even have a theory of why that's true, although I, I, I have one, of course, I have a theory about everything. Uh, uh, we don't understand intelligence enough to be sure that you can actually make an artificial intelligence that can self-enhance. The only method we apparently have is to get smart people to marry each other. <laughs> we don't have any other mechanism. And when that happens, you get the Huxley family where um, uh, 60% of the kids revert to the human mean, toward the human mean, they're still very smart. 10% um, are extremely smart, like their parents, and um, the remaining 20% uh, find themselves on the autistic spectrum. Yeah. So twice, twice the odds. And they belong to Mensa. This <laughs> so the, I, I am a little more, I believe I'm more likely to, I believe it's more likely that we will see artificial intelligence. I get messages uh, that confirm this through my teeth. Shut, it doesn't work any anymore. Um, in any event, the point is not whether or not we'll get them because we'll get various aspects of them. And they certainly will pretend that they're super smart. I mean, <laughs> look who does that already. Um, the, Works at Oxford. The, 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 point is, the point is, how can we get what's called the soft landing? Now, Ian Banks, in his future histories, he shows super smart um, computers that don't stomp us but love us and give us adventures so that we don't feel useless. Um, That's MGM, isn't it? Uh, yeah. The, <laughs> In my opinion, we've already had artificial intelligent creations for the last 200 years. They've been called um, mm -hmm. nations, corporations, uh, and recently, NGOs. Uh, and 90% of them are no smarter than the sum of their component humans. But we all know that there have been a few nations, a few corporations, and a few NGOs that have achieved what's still a murky miracle, but we're starting to study it. And that's the ability to behave in ways that are clearly smarter than the sum of their human members. Hmm. And in my novel existence, I show some scenes of self-forming smart mobs uh, who behave smarter than the sum of their human components. So we know some of the ways in which these artificially intelligent entities have behaved extremely well. And one of the things that has always been essential is that they can hold each other accountable. Mm. In other words, the answer to smart Skynet level machines is more Skynet level machines. The best example I can think of is lawyers. Uh, they are very smart, and the only reason why we haven't killed them all is because we can sick one against another. <laughs> all right. Well, I don't know. I, I, I just want to throw something in because I, I, I think that's a very strange remark. I mean, if you look at the events of August 1914, I mean, yeah. Germany, composed arguably of the most intelligent and educated people on earth, acted like a complete idiot. And that was not a member of my 10%. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right, let's just take another question. Over there. Who has that? <laughs> Over the years, uh, how has your thinking evolved and how's that uh, reflected on your craft as a writer? Um, I, I think, uh, our writing reflects all of that. Uh, you can track how my, how my thinking has changed. Uh, I started 50 years ago noticing that, uh, well, biting the bullet and deciding that Mars didn't have uh, uh, canals uh, 
d set out to uh, describe a, a, an inhabited solar system in which Mars was being virtually ignored. Um, bottom of a hole, you just avoided it because it would pull, pull your ships off course. Yeah, yeah you know, if you, age brings wisdom if you're lucky and paying attention. Uh, and that's what I've tried to do. Yeah, I, I've been seeking wisdom. <laughs> yeah, so, 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 I'll be here somewhere. I found it. <laughs> uh, you always reflect your life experience, and if, I've always said that every novel is a form of concealed autobiography. Uh, and this is uh, coming from a species, as I said, that uh, has never found a mirror it did not like. Uh, when you realize things like this, you, you know, we have great limitations. On the other hand, uh, we're doing extremely well, considered that we've been around maybe 200,000 years, and we've really gotten smart only in the last 500. <laughs> and that's an issue of human culture. So we should learn from history, which, as far as I can tell at UCI, they essentially don't teach anymore. <laughs> Uh, there is no major university in the United States that requires a, a course in American history or American government that I know of. Per certainly not in the Ivy Leagues and certainly not in UC. This is a huge, stupid mistake. <laughs> okay, over there. Uh, get a, hit this gentleman a microphone. I had a couple of comments about some of the uh, answers uh, the questions that the uh, panel was asked earlier. One is my solution to the Fermi paradox, <coughs> and the other is why, what we're going to find with our new telescopes when we get them. The obvious answer to me to the Fermi paradox is that people just don't uh, contact other people that much because, and if you think about it, we probably wouldn't either if we found a more primitive civilization. Your, We'd your probably stay away from grandchildren will write. What? <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> All right, just let, let's hear the Yes. Okay. So uh, even if we've been visited since this planet was formed, we wouldn't know about it because they don't want us to. How about or, the monolith? I saw or, the monolith. Yeah, that's <laughs> fine. But the, the idea that, I mean, many people here probably think we're being visited right now by aliens. That doesn't count uh, for what we're talking about. And that links into my second point about the telescopes. I think the most important thing we'll find with our new telescopes will be first contact. Now what I mean by first contact is not an alien talking to one of us. That doesn't count. I mean, if one beamed in here, talked to us for 10 minutes and then beamed out, that, what, that doesn't count as first contact because no one would believe us. We'd all be dismissed as a bunch of nuts. First contact has to be something that is indisputable. And a telescope will show you the lights of an alien city a thousand light years away. That can't be disputed. What does the panel think of that? I love it. Yeah. I'm waiting for it to happen. Let's go. <laughs> Make those big telescopes. Yeah. I'll just, uh, just in, in comment to that, because uh, I'll answer a question that I posed to the panel in the old duct, um, or most did. Um, in terms of discovering intelligent extraterrestrials, I think the way we're going to do it is this. We're going to put telescopes in space that can detect if other planets have oxygen in their atmosphere. If they do, it means they have life, okay, because oxygen, free oxygen does not exist in the absence of life on planets. Okay. Now, that wouldn't show intelligence, but let's say the frequency of planets or solar systems that have such a planet normally is, say, one in 300, but then we find one particular region of space where it's one in three. Um, that would show that there's an intelligent species operating in that region that is actively terraforming planets uh, nearby. Okay, that would be very strong evidence. That's what I, how I think we're going to find them. I don't think we're going to find them by listening for their S-band communications, because we're not using S-band anymore um, ourselves. Um, but anyway, that's my answer. Uh, we have only a couple of minutes left. Uh, I'm going to ask the panel a question. If we go into space, how far will we go and what will we become? Infinity and beyond. <laughs> <laughs> what will we become? I've tried to confine my reach because I don't know what humanity is likely to evolve into. Uh, there are several directions we could go, and I think we'll take them all. Uh, one group 
uh, rewriting itself uh, with, with gene, and, gene and genetic engineering. Uh, one group uh, going with alloplasty, which is, is uh, artificial legs and, and the like. Uh, one, one group uh, selective breeding, uh, one group, God, I don't know. Mm. Uh, we, we, will, we will not r recognize our descendants of the next 10 generations. Yeah. Uh, uh, once we get out of this spherical box, as I call it, that uh, we also call a planet, uh, all bets are off. And uh, uh, the, the argument that the really smart species can, can spread through the galaxies is not absurd. Stan Robinson and others have tried to argue otherwise, but I think that's a phony argument. So it, it's barely possible that the human species is going to last as long as the universe does. But it ain't going to look the same, and it may not be pretty. And in fact, uh, you might say the saga of our species is that we're, uh, we're mean, we're ugly, we're maybe hard to like, but we're damned hard to kill. And we talk better than the other aliens. <laughs> Obviously, none, none of them have con contacted us. There's so many paths that we can go that it would take a very large panel of science fiction writers <laughs> to explore more than a few of them. Uh, species can easily last a million years. Some species can last 10 million years. Few species last as long as 100 million years. So we can guess that in tens to hundreds of millions of years, we will be supplanted probably by some other species, possibly our descendant species or related species. So in terms of just where we're going, uh, we can expect that we will be different. But the wild card is, as Larry Niffen was just pointing out, we have the ability now to change ourselves. Mm -hmm. And when we can change ourselves, all of a sudden all bets are off. Yeah. We can become whatever it is that we want to be. And the frightening part of that is the story of Forbidden Planet, that we become <laughs> our own worst nightmares. The crow. We become <laughs> the, yeah. when we can become whatever we want to be, it's our id right. that tells us what we become and not necessarily our our ego or our super ego. Yes, After a thousand that's the Freudian years future. Of <laughs> shining <laughs> sanity. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but we're sure not going to be beat out by the horseshoe crab. I can guarantee that. <laughs> the, um, I attended the first um, interplanetary mi interstellar migration conference in 1984. Um, and um, back when I worked with Joe Carroll out there, and you should attend his talk tomorrow at 1030. It's, it's going to be very interesting. And Joe still hasn't taken the picture he promised to take. <laughs> um, the, uh, and, and at this conference, um, Jones and Finney showed that just by using the repopulation rates of the Polynesians, that if you used starships traveling just, you know, 10% of the speed of light between um, stars, then you paused for 10 generations to replenish population, build up an industrial base, then build another starship. Uh, 10 more starships and send them on. That with it, all it would take is 60 million years um, to fill the galaxy. Uh, if you make von Neumann self-replicating probes, as I talk about in, in my most recent novel, um, and these go from asteroid to asteroid in other star systems and simply mine the asteroids where all the wealth is and make a few dozen copies, refuel them, send them on. You fill the galaxy in three million years. So uh, there are some real burdens on this notion called the Fermi paradox. Um, and it's, it's a fast, that and the singularity are the two 
weird science fictional notions that are hanging in the air. And when you see things in the news, you wonder, is this pertinent to the Fermi paradox? Is this how other societies have failed? Or is this pertinent to the singularity? Is this how we get replaced by our own descendants? Um, it's a very interesting time to live when, um, but of course I have this reflex from when I was a youth to say, is this it to things in the news? Because every time when I was a kid, I saw a flash of light on the horizon <laughs> in the 1950s, I thought, is this it? Yeah. Dive under a desk, um, get ready for the apocalypse. Okay, well, this isn't it. This is just it for tonight. So thanks a lot. See you tomorrow morning. <laughs>